Hello, welcome to the 69th annual conference, annual meeting of the Utah State Historical Society um, on the theme public health and the common good. This afternoon, we have a session that um, pertains so directly to that question or to that theme with um, a group of contact tracers from the University of Utah's public health team who will be talking about the personal connections and contact tracing they've done over the past many months um, during, during our, our current pandemic. Um, so we will start that in just a minute. In the meantime, I'm gonna take care of a little bit of business and um, thank our conference sponsors, the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, our sister agency, and our, our parent department, the Utah Department of Cultural and Community Engagement. We also want to thank our partners and colleagues in the community, um, Utah Humanities and Utah Westerners. Thank them both very much for, for their sponsorship. Thank all four. Um, so we are again going to be talking this hour about contact tracing during the pandemic over the past several months and uh, remind you that tomorrow we have a wonderful keynote address from Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens about the connections between um, medical racism and um, the, the development of, of, of women's medicine in America. All right, so with that, I am going to turn the time to Lori Gillespie. Thank you, Lori, take it away. Hi, thanks, Holly. I really appreciate you giving us this opportunity to, to share our story. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, so I've been on the, the University of Utah contact tracing team for about a year, give or take a few days probably. It was the end of September last year that I joined the team. But um, my true calling is that of a storyteller. And so as I've worked through this job at the U and kind of embraced it, the thing that stood out to me is, you know, the, the stories that we can tell from this journey, this COVID journey that we've had. So, you know, stories have a lot of power and our brain is like the story processor. And if you think about stories, stories are really communal. There's, it can be argued that, um, that language was developed to tell stories and we like to tell stories and we like to hear stories and stories can be told in so many different ways, right? They can be oral, they can be written, they can be visual, they can be interactive. Um, they can be numbers, numbers tell a story. And public health is, you know, something that wasn't even on my radar before the pandemic, right? I mean, I knew it was a thing, but it wasn't something that I knew. And since I've had this opportunity to be on this team and do this work, public health has so many amazing stories to tell. So again, thank you for the opportunity for us to tell you the COVID contact tracing story. So the purpose of our discussion again is to tell the contact tracing story of COVID. And I hope that through this discussion, and I have a couple of really good friends that I've, I've made over the last year joining me today, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves as well. But what I hope is that we're going to do is today is document the impact that contact tracing has had on our community. And when I talk about our community, it's specifically the university community because that's where we've been working. But um, I think all of the things that we'll share relate to the larger community as well you know the cities and the state and the world and and um and then we're going to share some of those stories to help understand where we were where we are and hopefully where we're going to go and then i hope we're going to share some lessons that we've learned whether it's empathy and compassion perhaps tolerance kindness maybe patience I don't know. We, I want to. I hope that that we're going to share what we've learned and where this is going to take us. So, um, just a little bit of background about the University of Utah's contact tracing team. We were um, we were developed um, 
the development of our unit was built out of a collaboration with the Salt Lake County Health Department and the Utah Health Department. And it was specifically to meet the needs of the university community. And um, the first person I think that was brought on from this team of four that we have here today was Paige Checkets. So Paige was brought on to build and manage this team. So Paige, would you um, unmute yourself, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you've done? Hi, Lori, thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, so my, my background is in nursing. So I got my nursing degree and spent time in, in hospitals, ICU, um, oncology, and then I did liver and kidney transplant. So very sick people and high acuities. And so uh, I did that for a number of years and then um, took some time off to raise my family. When I came back, I felt impressed to go into public health. So, you know, like, unlike Lori, who said public health was not on her radar at all, it, it was on my radar. It was because I had a fascination with the um, 1918 flu. And I, I just consumed anything I could find about that. Um, and found it fascinating. So when it came time to get back into a profession, I, I decided to shift from the nursing field and, and look at public health. So I went back and got a master's degree in public health and, um, and also public policy because public health is, is largely determined by public policy. So I felt like those needed to be together. And, um, and I graduated in April of 2020. So came out of school right as, as coronavirus hit and felt incredibly overwhelmed and also prepared and excited to, to, to jump in. And so I did have to do some, some shifting. I was kind of focusing on some childcare uh, policies and work around childcare in the state of Utah. Um, but felt that I was more needed in in contact tracing. So that's how I got to this this point. And yeah, I, I was the first one hired and it was messy. It was uh, intense. It was um, exciting and, and just thrilling to, to put my degree right to work like that and to start building this team and start working with people and nobody knew how to do it. Nobody knew how to, to contact trace at the university level and something, a virus like this that we knew so little about. So it was, it was exciting and, and, uh, and fun and also very stressful. <laughs> that it is. And it still is. Thank you, Paige, for introducing mm -hmm. yourself. I think the next person from our panel to, to join the team was Jem Ashton. Um, you were an early joiner to this team. So introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your journey to, um, to contact trace. Yeah, so yeah, as you can see, and as Lori said, I'm Jim Ashton. I'm an undergraduate student of writing and rhetoric studies at the University of Utah. Um, and I'm a book artist, of course, based in Utah. Um, and I actually joined the contact tracing team not too long before Lori um, probably, I don't know, mid-August at the um, earliest. Um, and um, like Lori, my um, view of public health was, you know, somewhat limited. Um, I'd say, you know, my interaction with public health was posters might be on, you know, billboards or, you know, Bulletin, bulletin boards in whatever buildings I ended up at, you know, and there was those, you know, wash your hands signs in public bathrooms, all that. Um, and then of course, you know, all those articles we read on NPR about like, um, you know, contaminated produce and all that. Um, so, you know, I was very much on the receiving end of public health efforts. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until the, pandemic um, happened and I joined this team that I realized and learned that there actually always has been a lot going on behind the scenes. Sorry, my dog just kind of came into the room. 
it's doing some stuff, but um, <clears throat> but um, yeah. So when I joined the team, I realized that there has been um, at least somewhat of an infrastructure to do contact tracing, at least um, through state health departments and all that for various other um, diseases within the community. Um, and then, you know, it was a matter of, you know, ramping it up to this major scale. Um, and we had to get all of these people um, on board who had, you know, experience in public health as limited as mine, um, rather than relying on people who had, um, you know, considerable amounts of um, public health experience like Paige um, to handle a great crisis. So, you know, um, within the onboarding process, we had to teach all of these people about all of these public health concepts um, in addition to how to do the job. So it was like, um, you know, that's a lot. So good job, Paige. You're basically putting people through like a crash course of like a master's degree. <laughs> so good job there. So yeah, that's my experience on the team. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jim, that was great. Um, and the final member of our panel today is Christine Snyder. She has my name actually listed because she was driving when I sent her the link so that she could get on. But Christine is, um, she is an instructor and an epidemiologist. And um, I know that I've learned so much from her. So Christine, why don't you introduce yourself and how you got to the team? And are you a little frozen there? I hope that when I finish talking, you can unmute yourself. Um, if not, we can move on and, and come back to you in a minute. Um, Christine, are you there? Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, there you are. For some reason, my connection is not good, so I went outside. Maybe it'll work better out here. I'll, I'll switch to my computer here in a minute. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, that's my background. I uh, have worked as an infectious disease epidemiologist. I actually worked through the first SARS event that happened. I thought it would probably reflect that more than it has. Um, you know, that one passed by different, didn't turn into a pandemic. So I used to work for the, the Utah Department of Health. So at the state level, and then I worked in Nevada doing infectious disease and um, have been teaching at UVU for almost 15 years, including epidemiology. So uh, when this pandemic occurred, I think a lot of people that have worked in the field, you know, wanted to be a part and to contribute. It's a historical time and to, um, you know, use their skills to, to help other people. So I reached out to Sharon and I came on in September and right away noticed the need to track for clusters or outbreaks on campus and, and to look a little closer at some of the high risk areas. So that kind of became my focus as I came on the team. Um, was to look at some of those those high risk areas on campus, and uh, it's it's been a ride for sure. It's been great to work with this team, and we have a lot of stories to tell. Thank you so much. So, as you can see, just from the four of us, we have like this this big variety of experience, and you know we come from different walks of life, and every I think what I've discovered working with this team, and Paige, maybe you can speak to this a little bit better, is that we do have a diversity of people who do come from all kinds of backgrounds. From, I mean, we've had young students, we had someone as young as 18 who is an under, you know, a freshman working on our team, you know, all the way to, you know, people who have been in the public health field for 30 plus years, people who have come from you know, like me, not a public health and Jem, not a public health background to people who have been working through the master's program. I think we all bring various strengths and, um, you know, different ideas to this team. What have you discovered um, working with? I mean, I think our, I don't know how high, we, I mean, we had probably 30 people on our team in the fall. It was, it was quite a few. And we all brought different things to the table. What what do you think that that brought to the team having you know the opportunity to work with you know a, a wide variety of people? Yeah, I I, I think we've all heard that 
repeated in lots of different places and ways that diversity really is the power of and strength of a good team. And I, I think that is the case for us. We, we did try and, and uh, hire people with some medical and even public health background. Um, but we also, since we were just starting brand new fresh at the beginning, uh, we received a bunch of people who signed up because they wanted to help with the situation, the pandemic. And um, they were coming through the Hinckley uh, Policy, Policy Institute, the Hinckley Institute of Politics. So they were economics majors. They were, um, I think Jim was one of those, uh, you know, rhetoric majors. They were, um, yeah, a lot of political science majors. Uh, we had just a huge diversity of people. And, um, and that did end up being one of our strengths because not only did they see things differently and they were able to help us adjust our policies and our practices to um, reach more people, but they also had a, a really great skill of connecting with people from their, their background. We had a business major that, that really helped us because the, the business um, department, they had a different view on, on, on COVID and the way we should handle it. And he really helped us understand that. And um, so it, it was, it really was a, an important part of, of being a strong team is having that diversity. You mentioned connections. And I think that our job really was about connecting with people. Um, you know, as a contact tracer, you, you know, you look at this list of, of, um, confirmed cases that come in and you need to contact them. And in order for them to to tell you what's going on, you kind of have to make this connection. And, you know, some of them were easy. Some of them were not. Um, Jem, could you share, do you think, a couple of examples or how you felt it, how easy or difficult it was to make connections with people when you pick up the phone and call them? Because, I mean, as we're calling people, most of them are not feeling well, and they're getting a call from a number that they don't have in their contacts. And, you know, getting them to to answer the phone and and talk with us. What? How? How did you feel the connections were made? Was it difficult? Easy? That sort of thing. Well, overall, there was, you know, always a reluctance to make a connection, um, and or, you know, a downright, you know, unwillingness to make a connection in some cases. Um, you know, in our case, um, you know, working with a university population, um, it was usually more of the hesitancy variety rather than downright unwillingness, which Paige, I'm sure um, you have plenty of stories from when you were working with the Department of Health of people who were just completely unwilling to, you know, cooperate and connect and answer questions or even ask questions, just didn't want to be educated um, and didn't want to cooperate. Um, but, you know, as far as my experiences go, they really haven't been, you know, nasty people, which is great. <laughs> I like to be able to maintain that um, perception of the community that it's good people. You know, I don't like to get in that, you know, of course, with the pandemic, it was really easy to get in that frame of mind where you just see all of these people who are protesting the vaccination, protesting mask mandates, all that. And you're like, I can't believe I live among all these just complete psychos, um, you know. Um, but when you do actually talk to a lot of these people, you see that they just need to have, you know, a voice of reason introduced into their lives. Um, and a lot of their um, unwillingness to connect is, of course, um, tied to our community's deep-seated um, distrust of authority, um, especially as far as government um, institutions go. Um, and that's something that we've seen, you know, across the country, um, as particularly within states like Utah um, that have, um, this past of, you know, maybe seeing their community as being antagonized by the government. Um, 
so you know as a fairly light you know specific example of this um you know from my own contact tracing experience not too long ago um i was speaking with this man and you know when we begin our conversations we have to ask for some you know basic information to confirm their identities um so like their birth date and such and um you know this man was he said um he won't give his birthday out to any government organization and you know of course the university of utah isn't exactly a government organization and you know of course i also already had his birthday right on my screen because you know how else would i be able to use his birthday as a way to confirm his identity if i didn't already know what his birthday was so there was that whole thing where in my mind you know i had to you know switch into my you know best customer service voice and presentation mode where i have to like restrain myself from sounding too condescending from asking you know questions to get him to think about um you know the circumstances about the conversation where it's like don't want to act condescending because you know that's rude <laughs> um just want to prompt him to you know think a little bit um but anyway so after we moved past that and got talking and started to um you know slide into the you know more conversational real actualized you know human conversation mode um that he um you know was very comfortable with the conversation he was giving me all the information i could have wanted and even a little more um you know he was laughing making jokes um and it was all about kind of like breaking down that initial barrier of you know i'm not just a representative from an institution of authority i'm just somebody who's you know trying to work to help our community and you know help him um and when he realized that um you know our conversation was delightful um and you know if i had gone into you know maybe instinctive mode of being a little snarky <laughs> when um his initial difficulty popped up you know that wouldn't have happened so it's just a matter of um we were actually talking earlier um you know page of you know imagining a future where it's like maybe we'll need unvaccinated people because somehow the vaccine in some horrible twist is actually awful and we need all these people to take care of us you know us we like we would of course want to be treated with the same sort of you know you know humanity and dignity that we need to treat these people like although we're incredibly frustrated by them and you know of course we can't dismiss our frustration entirely because we don't want another year of this <laughs> um we do have to at least be respectful in our conversations with them because with their um relationship with these institutions of authority being as fragile as they are already we don't want to give them even more of a reason to you know distrust these institutions so that's another thing we have to consider um but yeah i'll leave it at that for now if you guys, if you guys have anything to add go for it <laughs> thanks that was really interesting i mean the, the biggest thing i picked up from from what you said jem was that as a contact tracer, you kind of have to be quick with reading the room, right? Within about 30 seconds of your conversation, you have a really good idea of, of which direction or which tone your call is going to take. And that's, you know, that can be a challenge sometimes because, you know, you, you know, you can't see the person, right? You can only gauge what they're saying and what you're hearing, you know, as far as, you know, even some nonverbal cues that you might get, maybe a grunt or maybe a cough or whatever. And so um, you need to, to, to really hone in on what they're feeling early so you know how to get them to engage with you. Um, and I think that, you know, that, I mean, I, per, I too have had conversations with people where they put up the wall and it's just not, not coming down. And so all you do is get the basic information that you need to get from them. But then there are other people who, you know, you can, you can have a, a deeper conversation with to see how they're really doing and ask them what kind of questions they have. 
and I've had conversations with people where they've asked me questions and they've been very emotional about the questions that they're asking. And if I don't have the answers, um, you know, going out and saying, I'll get back to you. I, I know that this is really important to you. And so I will go that extra step to ask the question of somebody I know can answer it and then come back and, and share that answer with you. And there have been times when I've come back with the answers and I'm like, I know this isn't the answer that you want to hear, but, and then you give it to them. And I've had more times than I can count people who have said, it means a lot that you went that extra step. And, you know, those personal connections that you make with them. And, you know, for a lot of our, our student population, those that were living on campus, they're, they're young, right? I mean, I have kids who are not much older than they are. And I keep thinking about them saying, what if this was my son? What if this was my daughter who was living in a dorm by themselves for the first time? And they're dealing with the, you know, the, the uncertainty and the unknown of what's happening. You know, they, they want that little bit of reassurance that somebody cares and i think that we were able to offer that to a lot of people to let them know that we're here and we care about you and we want you to be safe and we want you to be healthy and we want you to have the experience the college experience that you thought you were going to have and this is how we can help you do that and i think they really appreciate that and and i've learned so much from them and i hopefully think you know, I hope that they've learned some things from us as well. Um, Christine, I wanted to, to switch over to you for just a couple of minutes, if you don't mind. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, you talked about how you were brought on to kind of, you know, kind of look at the overall, what, what are we gathering? What are, what is this information telling us? What story is this telling us? And you were, you know, so good to, to come on and, and tell us that the, one of the first things you noticed were, you know, clusters of things that are happening and how can we address that? And, you know, how as a contact tracing team, do we need to be looking for things and we need to be asking the questions in order to, you know, to slow down the spread. So can you talk about that a little bit? Can you talk about what you've seen and, and what you've, you know, what, what those numbers and those, um, that data tells? No, I'm unmuted. There we go. Um, sure. Yeah. So yeah, like you said, when we came on, we noticed that, yeah, there was these connections between people and they were sometimes tricky to find. Some were easier, like athletics. That is a definitely a high risk area uh, that I started overseeing. But what we noticed is that it wasn't just that they were playing together, right? Like out on the court or the field. It was that they lived together and they socialized together and they ride in cars together. And so all of those things were important and we would see entire teams, you know, get wiped out with it. Um, and, and we'd send out a survey to ask those questions to find those links of what high risk behavior was. Um, and, and, you know, and other examples were the Greek life, like the, you know, the fraternities and sororities, we were seeing higher numbers there and just the challenges to get that information and find those links. Um, because, you know, people aren't always forthcoming in some of those, those events. So some, there was challenges there for sure. Um, and then, you know, not just in the student body, but um, in workplace, we found we were finding connections and, and, and finding, you know, some clusters there as well. Um, one of the big projects that we did, though, was to start to look at classroom transmission closer. And that is a trickier business to be able to, um, you know, recognize that, that it's being actually transmitted in a class. So that's something that we looked at in detail as well. Um, I don't know if you want specific stories around some of those, but that's kind of how we identified that. Um, we identified over, it was around, right around a hundred different clusters on campus in the fall. Um, and, you know, there were probably many more than that, but they, the definition was three or more cases in a two week period that we knew were epidemiologically linked. We knew they were connected. Um, and so that's kind of how we looked at that. And there were a lot of interesting stories around that, but mostly it's, it was gonna be um, in athletics or housing um, or in workplace is kind of where we found that. This 
time around, it's been different. We're seeing connections in classrooms right away rather than have to retro that and look at back at that. But um, that's kind of some of the areas that we saw risk for uh, multiple cases and small outbreaks throughout campus. So. Yeah, and you had some really interesting things to say. And, you know, when we think back about last fall versus this fall, there were fewer people on campus last fall, right, than there are this fall. You know, we, you know, it, it's it's almost like, you know, and I, and I hate to say this, it's almost like there isn't a pandemic, right? There's so many people um, kind of, you know, going about their regular lives. And I know that that many of them are vaccinated and many of them are wearing masks, but um, there's still this opportunity to be around more and more people and for longer periods of time too. Um, can you, can uh, any one of you talk to um, what we've, what we've seen so far this semester and you know what you think might might help slow down the spread there as far as um you know the fact that there are so many more people on campus i i want to address that first then i'm going to give it back to to uh, christy to talk about it from an epidemiological perspective but i just have to say it's been so um frustrating and and I, you know i have more compassion and patience with people on the phone that get covid or that don't want to get vaccinated i i have a lot of empathy for that but i really struggled when i was on capitol hill and and heard the discussions going on there and heard the testimonies of people with expertise and education testify what needs to happen to keep the campus safe to keep the community safe, to keep uh, all schools safe, to, to just really sh put a lid on this and, and then to hear them vote against those things, to hear them vote for things that were extremist ideas and fear-based. It just was really disheartening just to feel our legislature make those decisions. And, and then see the impact. So yes, it is different this year. Why is it different? Because the legislature has tied our hands and hasn't allowed us to practice the best principles that we know and understand about, about public health. And that has been really discouraging to not have their support and not feel um, their confidence in us as, as public health leaders and officials. That's discouraging, and that's what's made a huge difference this year. Yes, I agree with Paige. That's kind of the first place I went to was that legislation changed between last year and this year, and some of those differences for us specifically at the University of Utah were that um, seventy-five percent of you know had to be in-person classes, where that was not the case last year. Uh, live stream was not automatically, you know, incorporated in those courses anymore. They had to be at 75% capacity in the classroom, so you couldn't distance. We couldn't require masks. So all of those things did make it more difficult and with more people on campus. And last year, I think we had, how many did we have in HRE and housing was probably about, it's at least half of what is now. There's about 4,000 now. And last year, it was significantly less than that. So with all these people on campus and almost every case we investigate has a classroom associated with it, we're seeing just significant amounts more because of these things that we, like Paige said, our hands were tied. And so emotions are high, especially with faculty who feel unsafe or students, other students that feel unsafe or students that don't want the requirements. The emotions are all, emotions are all over the place. But just to give an example, last year in the fall, we did about, uh, 150 classroom investigations. We've done over 200 in the first few weeks and sent out over 10,000 exposed emails to those, those classroom, um, those people in those classrooms. So significantly more, and it will be throughout the semester because of those changes. In the spring, we only saw 55 because it was working, right? Like all those things we did in the fall were working and the numbers went down and then people were getting vaccinated. And then um, all these other changes. And when we saw the, obviously the Delta variant be introduced for a variety of reasons, and, and then just that surge and not having those same safety measures in place, it's really affected us this fall. 
I don't know if anyone else has anything they want to add to kind of those differences and how we've been tied that way, but it's been a challenge for sure. And we understand the frustration around, you know, faculty or other students, especially those who are at risk, you know, or feeling or have people at home that are at risk. So what are some of the conversations that that you all have been having as you're talking to faculty and you're talking to students? And do you do you feel like they are um, that their attitudes have changed. Um, what what are you seeing? Anybody want to speak on that? I mean, I can speak on that. <laughs> um, you know, I am seeing, like Christine said, that you know people are they're almost to the point of of wanting, you know. Uh, they're not sure. So I think uh, like last fall and even this spring, the, the, the cases we weren't seeing or were seeing late um, were almost like people didn't want to admit that, you know, th that they had COVID, right? Because it was almost, it felt almost shameful. It's kind of like, how did I let myself get this? Is that was the feeling I got from a lot of people. Now I think it's changed to, I don't know how I got this necessarily, but I don't want anybody else to get it either. You know, that, that whole conversation, that whole, um, there's been a shift. At least that's what I'm feeling from, from the stories that I'm hearing. Jen, would you agree with that? Do you, do you get that same kind of, of feeling from the people you're talking with? Yeah, I definitely have that same feeling and same experience. Um, last year, it was, there was definitely, you know, more shyness in their voice when talking to them. Um, but, you know, these days when we start a phone call, they're like, yep, I got it. What information do you need? So, you know, it's helpful, actually. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I think that, um, that you know, there's been so much education, you know, from from media and from from the university and from the CDC. I mean, you you kind of see. I don't know if, if you guys see it on your Instagram feeds, but I see things all the time, right? And maybe it's because I've started to follow some of those things, you know. But even even on Facebook or Instagram, if you post something, it puts is somehow there's I don't I don't understand all the you know technology background, but, you know, it posts a thing that that realizes that you're talking about COVID and it gives you a link to inf more information. And I don't know how it does that. Have you guys noticed that too? Right? So there's been like this, this, um, this like dump of information they want to make sure that that everybody understands you know how it's transmitted and what you can do to protect yourself and you know from our perspective um we we i think we've done a great job quite frankly um there's still more work to do obviously what has there's there's been a little bit of a shift in the focus of, especially with our, our smaller community, our university community, what that's going to look like, what our contact tracing is going to look like. Paige, can you talk about that a little bit? Maybe our, you know, it, the, the evolution, right? What, what's the evolution of what our contact tracing has looked like? Um, yeah, I, Lori, my mind kind of started going off. <laughs> I listened to you, but I was starting to think about, oh, yeah, that's right. We need to hire you know, 15 more people. So um, the interesting thing about public health is it's changing all the time. So whatever we designed last year, it, it's definitely still the foundation of what we have this year, but things are changing so much. And public health, you have to be real nimble. You have to be able to adjust and shift quickly to meet the needs of the public. And with this pandemic, it's been the same same way. It's these kind of we felt like we got a, a grasp on things and the, the the virus started tailoring off and the vaccines revved up. We we felt like, okay, this is we're wrapping this up. But 
but we kind of knew with this Delta variant around the corner that it wasn't over. And so um, we, we had a little pause in the, in the summer with the out students on campus and, and you know, athletic teams practicing. Um, but we, we kind of knew around the corner it was going to ramp up and, and sure enough it did. And, and unfortunately we, we weren't ahead of the game enough and, and I, I take some responsibility for that. I'm a positive person and I just keep hoping. <laughs> I just keep hoping that everybody's gonna do their part and we're gonna beat this and we're not gonna need this stuff anymore. But um, it, it's not looking that way right now. It looks like we're gonna need to really dig in and, and do some heavy lifting for the next several months. Um, and, and we're taking cues from the state health department that are that are you know kind of helping us make those decisions but um we're we're constantly evolving we're never in a steady state constantly changing um and and trying to meet the needs great thank you so um i want to leave a little bit of time for questions um holly do you want to pop on you do we have any questions that have um popped up for us yeah, just a minute. Let me show myself view in a minute here. And um, we do have some questions. We have, let me see just one second. Here. Oh, okay, there I am. Um, from the Q&A, we have Mike Martin asking, and this is, this is a question, a, a topic that we've been talking about all throughout the conference. He says, can you speak to health equity and its relationship to contact tracing? In particular, what challenges did, did you face, and I'll say do you face, when tracing with communities of color? It's a very pertinent question. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so anyone wants to? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Um, so Mike, that is a, an important part of public health and, and I'm glad that you're aware of it and you're asking about it. Uh, obviously at the, at the University of Utah, the community that we work with is, is of a very similar demographic, right? So they're mostly ages 18 to 25. Um, certainly we have other students outside that age range and we work with faculty members of all ages. And, and then, um, you know, we do have minorities in that group, but typically if they're there at the school, they are um, educated or getting educated and have support. So we see it differently at the, at the university than we do in the community. Um, for a while when things tailored off, like I was just describing, we did shift to um, vaccination outreach and we spent months calling uh, a list of people that we had received that uh, were at risk of not getting vaccinated because of uh, race or language barriers or um, you know, socioeconomic status. And so we did spend months reaching out and calling those people using interpreters to try and reach them and help them make those decisions. And, and it was really rewarding to, to see that it made a difference. Of course, you know, we reached about well, we reached a lot of them, but but only about 20% of those that we reached actually followed through with our recommendation to get vaccinated that we know of. That's the other thing with public health. It's hard to measure because you, you, um, you don't know how you impacted somebody down the road. We hope that every, every conversation we have and every bit of information we leave with somebody helps them make a better decision for their lives. But um, that's a great thing to do look at and you know follow Intermountain Healthcare. They're doing a lot of great things for our state in that regard and um, and uh, Utah Health Policy Project. They do a lot of good things around that too. So thanks for the question. Anyone else want to to answer that before I move on to the next one or, or add to that rather? Thank you, Paige. Okay. Um, all right from from an anonymous um, attendee says, have you seen resistance to participation in contact tracing, especially in relation to school age children? Because um, many parents are saying they refuse to participate because they don't want schools to close. So a difficult topic. Tread carefully. 
<laughs> well, we're actually, you know, obviously college level, but we have still seen parents get involved and, and be concerned about their their child for mental health reasons, or, you know, they've been already been quarantined once and here they're going to be quarantined again, you know, in housing, or can they even come to housing yet? They paid all this money and what's their experience going to be like on college. So we've definitely had to address that on that level as well with families. Um, there is always some level of resistance when we talk to people, um, you know, with some people, most people are grateful that we're doing something about it and helping out the campus. Um, but there is some of that there as well. Um, and enforcing those things can be a challenge as well. We are moving in a way that we're able to, to help with that on campus. I know people uh, worry about the mandates and whatnot um, that have been in place, you know, in school systems for as long as vaccines have been around pretty much. So uh, yeah, there is some of that, but I would say the most people are grateful and, and glad that we're keeping people safe on campus. To speak to school age children, that's different. I have worked with uh, some of the daycares on campus and that's been interesting, um, you know, cause people rely on those services and they follow the same rules as like a elementary school would. Um, and so we outreach to the Solly County Health Department to work on those cases and kind of solve those. But, you know, we're always gonna go with CDC protocol and uh, do our best to, to appease everyone and answer their questions and educate them. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Wendy has a question and then I have a question. Um, Wendy Rex asks it. She asks, can you speak to the economics of, of the pandemic in the university setting? Is this something that's part of your inquiry when you connect with people? I'd like to talk a little bit about this one. So um, that isn't necessarily something that we do talk a lot about, talk um, with talk about with people in our initial conversations with them. Sometimes they will ask um, questions about that, like what are resources available to me and we can direct them to those resources. Um, but that's basically our extent during our contact tracing. But then, you know, regarding the economics of, a, of the pandemic in the university setting, um, in my department, the writing and rhetoric studies department, we have had to cut down on a lot of our um, programs and we've had to um, shift a lot of our funding that would be going towards um, employment of, you know, adjunct professors, et cetera, et cetera, um, for, um, you know, emergency funding for a lot of students who um, lost their jobs and were unable to pay for tuition or, you know, all the other various resources that they then needed to get, like, you know, internet or a reliable computer while classes were online. Um, so we had to you know, shift a lot of the funding around, um, abandon a lot of projects that were, you know, critical to the success of, you know, our department um, and, you know, completely changed gears in a lot of ways. Um, and then thankfully, um, you know, there has been some federal funding coming our way so we can finally get a lot of that stuff back on track. Um, we just finished our um, grant pr proposal for the, um, ARP funding, um, and hopefully we'll get that, and hopefully we'll be able to have a lot of our colleagues <laughs> back in with us, um, because it was said that we had to, um, you know, push a lot of their projects aside um, to, you know, pick up on the assistance where, you know, our government essentially was not able to. That's, that is very interesting. Um, so my question is, and I guess it's a, a bit of a comment, is, you know, um, uh, Paige, you mentioned that you had been interested in public health for years because of the 1918 pandemic. And um, I, I have a family connection to that that has, has interested me in it for years. And I think it's been a touchstone for a lot of people. Um, and yeah, a touchstone and a way for us to connect and make sense of things. And, you know, a couple of days ago, we had a session from y'all's colleagues at the Marriott Library and, and in our division of state history that they've been collecting, um, collecting resources, collecting data, artifacts, whatever, um, from the community. So my question to you is that what, what do you want to see preserved? 
from this experience, from your experience? And, and can you donate it to them? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, what, what would you like to see preserved for, for posterity, I suppose, and future historians? Wow, Holly, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking back on, on the stories and the things that I've read and um, connected with and, and what, what of those things did I appreciate, you know, to, to kind of think of what we should save today? It's a great question. Um, and I, I loved, I have a family history connection to it too. One of my uh, great grandfather's um, brothers died in 1918 flu and and so I found that fascinating to go back and and read a little bit about that experience from my family's history um, but there wasn't a lot you know and I also remember like my grandpa talking about how his family um, so he was a child and and his family moved from Arizona to, to Los Angeles because they they wanted to go live somewhere where the air was cleaner. And so they moved. And, and I just look back at that and think of the the uh, changes that happened in my family um, because of that that move. And and he talks about how sad he was that he didn't get to see his grandparents very much anymore. And his mom wouldn't let him go visit him before they moved because she, they, they were afraid he'd get sick. And and so I just think of those personal stories that we all have. And I really appreciated Lori asking me and the team to, to write down our personal stories, not just how contact tracing is going, but how we personally have been impacted by that. And, and so I have this nice you know, two, three page thick document of, of my experience. And I think I probably should add to it because it is ongoing. So if we all just take some time to write down really how, how we are experiencing the pandemic, I think that would be super helpful. And then linkages. What, what um, Christy's doing in, in linking these cases together really is teaching us all so much about the virus, it, its personality, and uh, what it likes, what it doesn't like, and, and how we can learn to live with it or get rid of it. Boy, that's interesting. <laughs> Boy. Yeah, I could I just speak to that really quick? I know we're running out of time really fast, I promise. Yeah, no, no, go um, ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so that was a big thing for me, right? As I was, um, and this happened long before I even knew this conference was taking place. I, I spoke to our team probably before Christmas of last year, and I wanted to know what's been your COVID journey, right? And so I sent everybody a list of questions, and I'd be happy to share those with you, Holly, if you want. Um, and said, what's been your journey? What's been your biggest, what's been a triumph for you? What's been your biggest letdown? What's been, you know, tell me as much about what you've experienced. And I think, you know, as a historian too, that's what's important. That's where we're going to get so much of that information a hundred years from now, like we did with the, the, the Spanish flu, right? It's the personal stories that I, I'm so much about the narrative that, um, you know, I would love it if, like you said, as many people as you can can answer these questions and it is ongoing, right? Because we're not out of this yet. And, but I, I think that that's huge. And um, if, if Christine wants to speak just to a minute about the data and the linkages and that sort of thing, but that, that's where my, my passion lies. Definitely with data for any epidemiology history is, is always going to be useful to understand what happened in the past. Because, I mean, we do that with that 1918 flu. So we look at the numbers. And uh, so I think, yeah, that's really important. I, I was thinking, like, what kind of things do we want to save as well? But I would say just what procedures were what, and policies were successful and which ones weren't. And what was campus life like during this time? Because it is a historical time. And what measures we're taking and which were effective and which weren't and where did we succeed and where did we fail? I think those are all things that we would want to save and some of those successes will show up in the numbers or failures as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think those are all things that we would would save. but I'm curious when you say they, they have artifacts, like what kind of things do they have from 1918 that you saw? Uh, not, not 1918, they've been collecting actively from this pandemic. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, they set up some, and Wendy, maybe you can jump on since you have been involved in our, our 
portion of that. But, um, uh, you know, lots of, lots of photographs of panic buying oh. and kids during those initial weeks of shutdown and, um, you know, just personal, personal experiences. Um, and, and Wendy, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I'm happy to. We, I think the challenge for, for any archive is to know exactly how to ask the questions in the moment that will, you know, elicit people, get people to share their experiences. And so we did create um, a really flexible tool designed for students to share their COVID memories. And some of the submissions were just so touching. Um, kids would send in, and the idea was that they could do this through school if they wanted or as a home activity, it didn't really matter. But, um, you know, one family sent in a, a sheet where they had put in thumbnail photos of each one of them in their masks, as well as all of their pets. Mm -hmm. um, so, so just like mo images that capture it in a kind of from the perspective of the home or a child, that's really what we were hoping to gather. I do think pictures are powerful as well, just like because they tell a story. Mm -hmm. And on campus, I think it would be fascinating to have pictures of those students separated in class with masks on or the mass testing as they come back to school, those lines to get tested, you know, going into housing or even with the vaccinations now. Some of those vaccine events that we did, we did fun vaccine events too, like where Swoop came and, you know, the football players came and, and things like that to get people motivated to get vaccinated. So I think those are definitely, definitely gonna be a part of history and will be interesting for people to look back at and see what it was like to live through that and, and go to college during those times. Cause it's, yeah, obviously definitely unique. It's a good reminder for all of us <laughs> to yeah. not be so busy that we don't we don't preserve what we, we've been living through. Um, well, Lori, do you want to have the last word? You put together this panel, and I want to thank you for doing that. Well, thank you. I I don't know what else to add except this has been um, a fun experience. I hope that you've um, that we've added something to your conference, and um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. And thanks for doing the contact tracing. Um, so we've got one more session this afternoon and then, and then our keynote tomorrow. So thank you everyone for attending and y'all for, for teaching us and just say thank you and take care.